those I haven't met, I'm Claire Fox and I'm the director of the Academy of Ideas. And one of the key themes of this year's festival is actually exploring identity. Obviously, identity, we always have had identity. We all care about our identity. But in many ways, public life today is dominated by, in a way, the way that identity has become politicised. And it's a very significant shift in kind of public discussion that people will say things like, as a woman, as a black person, as a Muslim, when they start a conversation, or self-identify and have dilemmas about how they identify. So we want to just discuss some of these issues, how they emerge, how they affect the discussions uh, that we have in politics today, and work out whether it's problematic, whether there's anything more to say. Now, we've got one mini lecture to start with, which is going to be given by Professor Frank Brady, and I'll introduce him in a moment. And then I've got three people who I'm then going to turn to after Frank has spoken. I'm going to ignore Frank. And then we're going to say, we're going to have a chat amongst ourselves about both what Frank said and a bit about the themes and why people are interested in this issue. And then we'll bring back Frank in for a minute. But we're then largely what we want is a really vibrant discussion. Now, the one thing about identity politics that has emerged is it's under the guise of identity politics that one most hit, often hears the phrase, I find that offensive. That's a kind of fairly regular way that it's happened. So what it would be really good to do at this event is to suspend that phrase. I don't want to ban it, because that would be too ironic for words. Um, but, I, <laughs> but rather than kind of saying, as a, I find that offensive, in an attempt to close down debate, let's try and be open about it. There's also quite a lot of walking on eggshells that goes on in relation to identity politics. And I think and hope that if you've been here for some time, we can trust each other now to try and say things and know that sometimes if we don't exactly say the way we want to, that people should take it in the spirit of a point well made. So that's my slight rider to the event. OK, so let me introduce my panel, my, who are up here. We've got Professor Frank Faradi, who's a sociologist and commentator. He's the author of How Fear Works, The Culture of Fear in the 21st Century. And he's also the author of Populism and the European Culture Wars. He's the author of numerous books. He's an internationally acclaimed public intellectual. And one of the things which he's been writing a lot about and talking a lot about in the last few years is indeed identity and the culture wars. The other people that we have on the panel are closest to me is Eric Kaufman, who's Professor of Politics at Birkbeck College at the University of London. And he is, he's, he's got lots of famous things which you can look at online, but he's here predominantly because he's the author of a new book about to be out called White Shift, Immigration, Populism and the Future of White Majorities. And I think flyers have gone round. It's, we're just missing it. He's actually on Start the Week tomorrow morning <coughs> discussing his book with Francis Fukuyama, actually. And so uh, it's kind of very much in the ether, this kind of debate. At the far end there, we've got Rachel Halliburton, who is associate editor of Avant magazine. She's the author of The Optical Illusion, a very 18th century scandal, which was shortlisted for the HWA debut crown. She's written widely on politics and culture, for everybody from the FT, the Independent New Statesman, and has interviewed people as different as Henry Kissinger and Gorbachev. And I've known Rachel on and off for some time, and I always enjoy having her views, and she's somebody who likes to be challenged. She said, give me an issue that I think will challenge me and that I'll think about, and I couldn't think of anything better uh, than this one, because I think that Rachel always thinks afresh about issues, so I'm looking forward to her views on this. And then we have got... Remy Dekoya, who is a PhD researcher on identity politics at Sheffield University, a columnist and former political editor of Warsaw Business Journal, and he's written for Foreign Policy, Foreign Affairs, Guardian, all sorts of people, uh, Quillette, uh, Washington Post, a member of the editorial working group of a review of African political economy, and has written some extraordinarily interesting things on identity. I saw an interview with him, I've read an interview with him, I read an essay by him on identity, and I just was desperate to get him here, so I was delighted when he said yes. But can we give a warm welcome to all of our... Frank. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm involved in a research project which attempts to explore the historical development 
of uh, sensibilities that today we call identity that existed and were associated with words like the self or, or the individual in previous times. And I'm going back all the way to the um, beginning of historical time, going back to the, uh, the biblical era, all the way to the Greeks, trying to understand what is special about the situation today. I'm doing that because I think we do suffer from a profound sense of historical amnesia when it comes to identity. We almost assume that identity has always existed. If even Claire used the term, there's always been identity. Actually, that's not true. There wasn't identity always, and certainly, insofar as there was any use of the word identity, it meant something very different to what we mean by it now. So when the Greeks talked about identity, and then the Romans after them, they were talking about identity essentially as sameness. You know, the kind of questions they were asking when they were looking at identity is, is the man or the woman the same person as she gets old as when she was young? What is it that kind of com makes us similar? You know, what is it that gives the personal qualities this kind of similarity? The very use of identity in those days, all going back all the way to the medieval era, when you're looking essentially at sameness, was the very opposite to now where identity is increasingly defined as one of difference. It's the difference between you and me, uh, uh, between me and the other, that becomes the distinguishing uh, element to which identity is giving meaning. And I think it is interesting that the first time that in an interest in identity emerges is after the First World War, when the relative certainty of all pre-existing forms of self-definition, including the modern ones, began to be called into question. And the literature where you find what we call identity today first explored is actually in literature. If you read, for example, Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, you'll find that there's a kind of, you know, a kind of attempt to kind of deal with this. There's Musil's uh, sort of writings uh, which begin to explore this kind of tension between, you know, asking the question of who am I and all those kinds of issues. And you find that, for example, the first reference to it in the social science sense of, of the meaning of identity, comes with Freud, when in a passing remark, he, he talks about his Jewish identity. Uh, and then he kind of never refers ever to that ever again in all of his writings. So it's a, a relatively new concept. And if you look at the, uh, the literature and the books written in the interwar era, you'll, you'll find that there is simply no definition. And indeed, when it comes to the politicization of identity, the terms, they simply do not exist. Uh, and they didn't matter particularly until, it, until the cultural turn of the 1960s. So for example, in the 1950s, the 1960s, and even in the early 1970s, there is no discussion of sexual identity. The first book on gender is in, sorry, the first article on gender, the monograph, is in 1964, but even there, it's not related to an identity. There is no discussion of ethnic identity, there is no discussion of political identity, or national identity, or corporate identity, or brand identity, or of identity crisis, or all these things of losing and finding one's identity, all those things that we're using now, are simply not referred to in that earlier discussion. There are other concerns that people have that may be analogous or similar, but certainly the separation, the abstraction of identity as an exi something that exists in its own on, on right doesn't simply exist. And what I find truly fascinating is the rapidity with which both the term identity and the term identity crisis just explodes in a very, very short period of time. Something that did not exist, uh, people didn't talk about it, people didn't write about it, all of a sudden uh, envelops and captures uh, our imagination. Eric Erickson, uh, the, the famous psychologist, who coined the term identity crisis in 1944 uh, as a way of dealing with and making sense of some of the traumatic disassociations that soldiers had in the Second World War, um, was himself quite surprised when this uh, fairly alien and, and fairly esoteric concept, the identity crisis, suddenly captured the, the public's imagination. And in the 50s and the 60s, more and more people began to talk about identity crisis in all kinds of of different settings. And I think what's interesting about Erickson, and Erickson himself said, you know, there must be something weird going on that, that all of a sudden identity crisis becomes this defining phrase of the 1960s and 1970s. Erickson himself 
never used the question of identity crisis in relation to collective entities. So it wasn't, it wasn't about the identity crisis of black people or a woman or anything else. In fact, later on, cultural feminists would criticize Erickson for talking about identity crisis just simply in relation to the individual, because that's really what he was concerned with. It was an individual affliction that he's really looking at. Because what Erickson was concerned with was the crisis of the individual, particularly of teenagers, whose identity crisis served as a catalyst for achieving adulthood. So the identity crisis that he's describing really deals with this attempt to become an adult and, and the process through which that development would occur. It's also very important to remember the context within which identity and identity crisis were first discussed. It, it was a very different context uh, formulated uh, than, than is the case at this particular moment. Uh, it's, in a sense, what's very interesting is that when Erickson talks about the identity crisis and how you gain an identity, you know, because the way you resolve an identity crisis is by eventually gaining an identity, the accomplishment that Erickson emphasized as being crucial for the gaining of identity is something that we don't talk about now at all in relation to identity, which was that of work. In other words, it was through your work, it was through your vocation that young people acquired their identity. It wasn't through their sexuality, their gender, their cultural uh, linkages, you know, their national, their religious, none of those things were particularly uh, important. And he had very little to say about all these issues that we now call gender-related issues and all those kinds of stuff. And he basically makes the point, and he, just to quote him, he says, for men to take his place in society, he must acquire a conflict-free, habitual use of a dominant faculty to be elaborated in an occupation an occupation which is a limitless resource. And he talks about the fact that through the occupation that you choose to embrace as a, as a, as a young person, you develop companionship, you develop links and, and people who, uh, in a sense, are, are watching you back that are, are, are very much linked to it. And in a sense, what he's really talking about is that the occupation you choose and the work that you do is what really gives you meaning about who you really are. Right, it's the work. And we forget that because, of course, today in the 21st century, we very rarely talk about our work being a source of identity. I mean, we become much more passive in relation to the external environment because identity these days is seen as something that you're born with, something that you, you kind of already possess, rather than something that uh, may come about through your work and your uh, relationship to external reality. In his writings, Erickson makes a, a very interesting distinction, which again is now overlooked and often lost. He makes a distinction between what he calls identity consciousness, and by identity consciousness, what he means is an overt concern and preoccupation about identity questions. It's when you really are worried about your identity, something that you're not really very sure about. And he calls it a pathology that is associated with the quest for identity development. The fact that you're so worried about your identity, in his writings as a, as a psychologist, he sees, as to, as to some extent, uh, a, a bit of a problem uh, that you become so preoccupied with that. And he uh, contrasts identity consciousness with what he calls a sense of identity, a sense of identity. And by a sense of identity, he talks about the experience that is pre-consciously developed through becoming well in a psychological sense. So for him, the sense of identity is something that you don't need to advertise, you don't need to talk about all the time. It is something that you've gained through making that transition to adulthood and work, as opposed to what he calls the consciousness of identity, the identity consciousness, which in his writings and in his uh, theory is seen as something of a pathology. Now, of course, we know that it is the sensibility that Erickson called identity consciousness, which pervades public debate and discussion. Today, we live in a world where you wear your identity in your sleeve, you never stop talking about it, you continually advertise it, and it becomes, uh, in many uh, settings, uh, a, a kind of a defining feature of who you are. And we also know that in the discussions that we have about identity, it doesn't matter that you're a doctor, an engineer, a plumber, or a miner, or a nurse, those things that you actually do, spend your day-to-day uh, uh, -day life uh, involved with, 
are seen as being uh, secondary or, or even kind of marginal. One of the things that has occurred, uh, which, which is really uh, something that is first noticed and discussed in the late 70s, but becomes obviously much more uh, pervasive in our time, is identity politics. And one of the things that identity politics does, or I prefer the term the politicization of identity does, is it reverses the relationship that Erickson had between, the, between ind individual identities and collective identities. Erickson initially doesn't talk very much about collective I identities, neither does anybody else. I mean, identity as a concept, as a psychological concept, as a social science concept, is essentially linked to the individual and the quest of the individual for self-realization and becoming, uh, becoming an adult. And I think that what happens is that at a certain point, uh, and even Erickson notices this in the 60s, the collective dimension of identity that is, that is kind of identified, the collective dimension of identity begins to overwhelm the concern with individual identity. That's what Erickson says. Actually, I think Erickson is not right completely because as the collective dimension of identity overwhelms the individual identity, what you have is the erosion of the line between the two. I think one of the interesting things is that as we become more obsessed with identity politics, we also develop this concept which, which people often use, which is the personal is political. And the moment you have this idea that the personal becomes political, then the, uh, the, the dividing line between you as an individual and people who look like you, who have the same gender as you have, who make love the same way as you do, all these things become entirely intermeshed, uh, which I think is a, a significant in the de uh, development and, and is really very, very important. And in fact, in, in, in one of my, in, in my work that I'm carrying out, in one of the chapters I'm working out, I make the point that one of the most important consequences of the erosion of the line between the individual and the collective in this kind of new way of, of, of seeing uh, identity is what you basically have is a, a situation where the self, which used to be a, a, a kind of a concern of philosophy, of theolo theology, of intellectual investigation, you know, what is the self, you know, with the, uh, with the statement that the personal becomes political, the self becomes depleted of moral content. The self itself becomes no longer that important. It becomes less interesting because what displaces it is this, is, is this idea of, of identity. And what, one of the things about identity is that, you know, the minute you became, begin to politicize identity, it distracts from yourself. Because one of the features of, of the politicization of identity is you demand to be recognized. I mean, you, you will find a, a demand for validation. All the activists are involved in identity politics are continually demanding that their way of life be validated, it be recognized. Uh, they demand that, uh, that their view of the world uh, should be privileged. There's a continuous discussion that is going on about the, about the importance that what they say about their experience, about their way of life, what they say about who they are should be seen as being gospel truth. You know, the kind of recognition that, that is being demanded almost has an, a quasi-religious overtone because you're sacralizing identity, which is why, for example, when you had this hearing in the United States with Kavanaugh, people would you know, almost kind of, and these are university educated people with PhDs, would almost casually say, believe, right? You have to believe her. I mean, the act of belief was mandatory. You, and I, I know people who were called that for the fact when they said, look, I don't believe anything just because I need to believe. I believe something when I've seen the evidence, the facts, when I heard the evidence. But this demand to be believed uh, uh, that the victim is always right, that the person make that st statement, uh, that testimony is inherently the truth, uh, basically means that there's a new way, there's a new kind of way uh, that you remove uh, the persona from the self towards something that's a little bit different and external to it. And one of the cu curious features of the politicization of identity is that it basically uh, uh, comes along with a new way of understanding a human being. If you look at the theorists in the 70s and the 80s who promoted identity politics, they basically said that there is no such thing as a self, that it's essentialist to have uh, the idea that there's something real within the self itself. And where, while they were quite happy to deconstruct the uh, identity, uh, that deconstruct the self 
of, of people and completely empty it of any kind of a meaning, the same people that were emptying the self of any content were at the same time fossilizing identity. So the self was false. There is no such thing as a self. It's not really true, but our identity is real. Our identity almost has a, an objective, biologically determined, physical kind of content to it. And you find that increasingly you have a discussion on identity, where, for example, some gay activists are saying that we know that being gay is natural because it's in our DNA. And you have trans activists now coming along with kind of elaborate arguments about how neuroscience proves that the way they regard the world is entirely natural. So you've got this kind of paradoxical situation where the, uh, the, the self itself is increasingly regarded as false and, and erroneous, but identity has almost like this rigid, uh, fossilized reality that people kind of insist upon uh, on it all the time. One of the problems that, that exists with identity politics is that by its continuous demand for validation, it alters the way we relate to each other, you know, because unless you validate people, they, they, they're somehow offended or, or, or their persona becomes deconstructed. And as a result of that, what you have is a, a continuous devaluation of a number of important uh, values that have always been central to liberalism. So with the rise of identity politics, the individual no longer exists, and they say that the individual is a myth. You know, sort of, you find increasingly that not only is the individual a myth, but they also argue that the idea of moral autonomy is, is a force, that we cannot act as autonomous agents in our own right. And from their point of view, what really matters is the group that you belong to. It's almost like we become these um, template characters who are defined by you know, sort of the identity uh, group that we belong to. And I think under those circumstances, what you have is the gradual cultural devaluation of virtually every value that emerged within the Enlightenment. Everything from universalism to autonomy to freedom, they all become second order principles because what really matters is, is, the, is the centrality of validating that identity. I just want to end on one point that I think we need to take very, very seriously, is that people think, well, okay, Frank, what's your objection to people validating their identity? What's wrong with that? Well, what's really wrong with that is that when identity becomes politicized, the very act of validating an identity invariably in our society leads to its, its, its call for spoiling other people's identity. I think what you will notice is that we live in a world where not all identities are given equal valuation or equal validation. For example, one of the identities that is marginalized and pathologized is national identity. I mean, I think it's quite curious that it's okay to be gay, it's okay to be of a gender, it's okay to be disparate, but, but to, be not, to have national affiliations to feel patriotic, to identify with a particular community is seen as somehow backward and xenophobic and reactionary. You will find that uh, increasingly uh, there are statements being made where you know, Western identity uh, is, is kind of almost kind of constructed into this devilish kind of, kind of, kind of characteristics. And more laterally, you've got this interesting idea, which, which has only emerged very, very recently, where somehow white people are given an identity, and the very minute that they're given an identity, you, you've got your whiteness, that immediately uh, serves as a, as, a, as, a, as a symptom of the fact that you're on a lower, a lower order in terms of the, of the human identity stakes. So what I want to end on by arguing is that with the spoiling of identity, with identity validation being always in the air, what you invariably have is a, gr is a growing process where identities are continually splintering and, 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 and fragmenting. And you think you've seen the last word with identity politics, with the construction of trans identity. I'll tell you that if I was to give you this lecture 10 years from now, you will see that if the present process continues, we will see dozens of other new identities that you haven't even heard about kind of coming to the surface, all of them saying that finally, our reality is being recognized, that finally, we've been ignored all these centuries, but now, these identities are allowed to come to the surface, and uh, I'm happy to bet with you on it, you know, give you my 50 pounds against your one pound, uh, I'm fairly <laughs> sure that I will win the stakes. Yes.
So, uh, thank you, Frank. And I think that we wanted to take a step back there and look at, historically, try and locate the issue of identity. And also, as Frank has done, to kind of sociologically try and understand it. I'm not suggesting when I turn to my panel that we're not going to kind of carry on at a high level. But, but because it's me, we're probably not. I wanted to kind of talk about some of the lived realities of this issue as it's experienced and kind of just mull them around and then reflect on what Frank said. Remy, I think you, you talked about identity populism. I, I think that might be mm -hmm. something the way you've uh, talked about it. And I, in a way, one of the questions is why certain groups of people have chosen to go down the identity path. You know, it's not something if you were a, an anti-racist in the past, you didn't sort of do a, I identify as or go into identity politics. But do you want to kind of mull over that and anything Frank said? Well, mulling over what um, uh, Frank said, I think essentially what really came out there is that constructions of identity definitely still revolve around notions of sameness and difference, definitely with group identities. Regarding why identity politics is thriving now, obviously like with all ideologies, we can, you know, there's a demand and supply situation. Since it's thriving, clearly there's a demand for it. So the question is what's driving the demand? I think it serves two important functions for a lot of people. <clears throat> so there's the emotional function. So it gives people a sense of certainty, a sense of you know, being within a group. There's a strength in numbers. In these days, especially on certain times, fragmented times, it gives people something emotionally. Regarding interests, I think um, uh, certain groups of people, probably rather from the middle and upper classes within certain groups, like for instance, black people in the West, have identified their identity politics as a useful strategic tool towards attaining status and resources, essentially. You know, you use the strategies that work. You try a strategy and it works once, then you try it the second time. And if it works the second time, then you might you push some more, maybe you might get a little bit more. So yeah, so those are the two essential functions I think it fulfills, and these are the reasons why it's thriving. Okay. Uh, Rachel, you can kind of come back on anything you want, but one of the things that's happened in in arguments in relation to literature, in fact. It's become quite controversial, I've discovered recently, to say that, you know, this, this great work of art has universal appeal, you know, and across Christ and, and people will say, well, no, universalism is just a, a cover for Western colonial domination and white supremacy. And you say, no, it's a great work of art, it's got universal, no, no, no. And we want certain, you know, artists of colour or writers of colour in university, you know, the whole, that sort of stuff. And it is extraordinary because it is, a real shift in the way even you would critique the canon, that yes. it's gone down the identity thing. And there's also all of the kind of cultural appropriation debates that are now lurking around the arts and literature as well. Again, heavily imbued. But, you know, any thoughts? I, I do to a degree, but actually before I address that, I wanted to um, come back to this question that Remy was asking of, of why it's happening now, why it's particularly intense now. And um, because, you know, on the face of it, one of the reasons it's particularly frustrating is surely this is the time for people to be adopting a forthright, outward-looking perspective. You know, as everything from abuses of power in Saudi Arabia to the daily more surreal manifestations of Russian foreign policy challenge the way we interact with the world. And as a student, I mean, I was at university during a sort of less political time. And so, you know, I, I remember our hunger for sort of things like this to be grappling with. And what I decided to do was have a look at um, the noughties, you know, the point when it kind of started to um, surge again. And, and, you know, to also a time where one seismic political event after another seemed to redefine the cultural and intellectual landscape. So what do we have, you know, around the time of the emergence of identity politics? We have the Twin Towers attack in 2001. We have the Iraq invasion and the accompanying political disillusionment in 2003. We have the financial crisis of 2008 and the Arab Spring of 2011. Now, you said you wanted me to do some fresh thinking. So I wanted to look quite broadly at the impact that these political events had on liberal intellectuals. And it occurred to me that a good measurement of this would be the New York Times non-fiction bestseller list. Now, I had a hunch that I might find something there, but no more than a hunch. So it was quite exciting to realize that it revealed something extremely interesting. Now, in the years running up to Iraq, the most popular non-fiction books tended to include World War II histories, popular science, sports memoirs, and new perspectives on icons, 60s icons uh, like the Beatles or JFK. In 2003, it changed completely. 
About 50% of the books published were either about America's hypocrisy, not least Michael Moore's, oh, sorry, about skeptical accounts of Bush's decision to go to war, or satirical books about America's hypocrisy, not least Michael Moore's stupid white men. Five years later, at the time of the financial crisis, this trend was still going strong, with at least three big serious best-selling books explaining why the political process could not be trusted, and satirical works including Stephen Colbert's I'm America and So Can You. So it was pretty clear that if you were listening to the talk shows, reading the book's pages, or even just sharing YouTube clips of the latest comedy, culturally there were two dominant messages. One was, democracy doesn't work, and the other was, powerful white men lie. Now you would hope that the message that an intelligent and engaged person would take away from this is that the level of political debate needs to be improved so that all the right people can be held to account. However, it's not impossible to see why a generation appears to have concluded that they would turn their focus onto something like identity, on which they feel they might be able to have some kind of meaningful impact. OK, so I'm going to come to you in a minute. But Remy, I, I suppose just kind of on that why it's emerged, one of the things is obviously the lived experience, because one mm. of the things that you hear most often is, well, you don't understand what I've been through. Mm. And just following on from what Rachel said, it just struck me that there's a kind of sense in which the kind of wanting to say something politically turns into a you don't know what the experience I'm having is as a way of kind of asserting yourself into politics because mm. there was nowhere else to go with it. But anyway, any thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts on that, again, would be similar to what I said at the beginning, that I think the you don't know what I've experienced uh, strategy is used also because it's been effective, because you don't know what I've experienced. So you can't come back and counter that and say, well, I actually do know what you've experienced. <laughs> Uh, so that's why it's a useful strategy, simply, and that's why it's being used. Okay, so turning to Eric now. So, Eric, one of my, one of the things, I mean, you can explain what it is that you're trying to get at in the book very quickly, but one of the things that Frank said, you'll never know what's going to emerge next. One of the maybe more unexpected, although you could have anticipated if you thought about it, is the emergence of identity politics in and around being white. Now, you know, initially it was a kind of like white supremacy or white privilege, a critique of, if you know what I mean. And then the reaction, and sometimes it's actually explained as the reason why Trump got elected, was people started saying, well, what about the white working class? And, you know, there are so many articles on the white working class. And then people, unlikely people in some ways, when you kind of get involved in discussions, who suddenly start asserting themselves as, you know, what about us? Playing the victim card emulating and imitating a lot of the... Uh, uh, do you kind of go along with some of that? Yeah, to, uh, very much, and I, I very much agree with the critique that you and Frank have made of uh, left-wing identity politics. Now, I, I mean, I slightly disagree to some extent with Frank in the sense I agree that there's been a problem of excess identity politics, and the personal is, is the political is, is the best illustration of that, or the idea that you can't understand because you're not black or a woman. But I actually think that we would be making a mistake if we try and get rid of identity altogether and go into a kind of enlightenment universalist individualist mode, which will suit some people. Some people can do that, but I think most people actually, you know, Charles Taylor and some of the communitarian writers do argue that the, I, the groups that we choose to belong to are a part of our individuality, and especially those that are multi-generational, that survive us, our death, nation, ethnic group, religion, etc. So I don't think we're ever going to get fully past those, but what I think we can get to is, is a moderate. So there are moderate and extreme forms of ethnic identity, national identity, and that's a key difference. In conflict zones, Yugoslavia, I mean, the whole point is to get, it's not to erase the difference between Serb and Croat, but actually to get each group to stop thinking that the other side is out to get them. And, that they're, they're, and only focusing on the atrocities that the other side has committed, but to move to a more confident kind of ethnic identity. The Irish have done this even in, in the last sort of 30, 40 years, gone from a more victimhood-based identity to a more confident-based identity. And you saw that in their response to the, the Eurozone crisis. They picked themselves up by the bootstrap, and it wasn't all about colonialism in Brussels. Where the white thing comes in is that I think behind this warping of identity is this ideology I call left modernism, which is sort of the dominant ideology in the high culture. And I explain this in the book and where it come from. It actually has deep roots. It's not post-2014 development. And what this ideology has done is, is it's done two things. It's sort of accentuated a kind of victimhood identity of minority groups, but it has also 
suppressed and demonized the majority, white majority identity. And that's something that we have to keep, we have to keep both in mind. And that sort of demonization and suppression and association of white identity with guilt is part of the story of the right wing populist blowback that, that if you look at voting for Trump, for example, um, white identification was, was a major predictor in the survey data. I look at a lot of quantitative survey data. The other thing is, it is not the case that attachment to your own group means you hate the other group. In fact, there is no correlation. The psychological literature 50, 60 years shows there is no correlation between attachment to own group and dislike of a group, except in situations of violent conflict. So I think it's very important to keep in mind that identity per se is not an awful thing, but we need to move towards a moderate identity where you see the best in other groups, where it's open, and get away from this kind of extreme victimhood-based identity. Rachel. And, and can I, I, I completely agree with you. I think the, the initial impulse behind identity politics is completely right. You know, cultural narratives about what it means to be a, a woman or trans or be an ethnic minority need continually to be challenged. I mean, not least because the way people perceive your cultural worth has an impact on whether acts of violence are likely to be committed against you or not. And I mean, we're, we're repeatedly seeing headlines about, you know, what, how, how much you're likely to be paid. Um, but so, yes, what interests me is why victim tactics are, are seen at the moment to be the right way forward. You know, they're not, but, but why is this generation deploying them so relentlessly? Now, I was really interested, Remy, when you started talking about sort of middle and upper class mm -hmm. uh, people <coughs> starting to use this. There was um, a fascinating analysis done by the sociologists Bradley Campbell and, and Jason Manning. Um, and they say, um, so they're, they're, they're looking at um, ongoing inequalities as they're based on university campuses. They say, since the rights movements of the 1960s and 1970s, racial, sexual, and other forms of intercollective inequality have declined, resulting in a more egalitarian society in which members are much more sensitive to the inequalities that remain. So there is a degree to which it is the fact that you know, these students are enjoying kind of more parity with each other status-wise, that they feel that they can challenge each other in this way. The other very interesting thing about their analysis is the way that they show how that this is essentially an extension of the litigation culture that has proliferated first in America and now here. They point at, out that the last few decades has seen the continued growth of legal and administrative authority, including growth in the size and scope of university administrations and in the salaries of top administrators and the creation of specialized agencies of social control, such as offices whose sole purpose is to increase social justice by combating racial, ethnic, or other intercollective offenses. Now, one of the biggest aspects of um, victim culture is the ability to appeal to an adjudicating third party. And I guess it becomes self-perpetuating. Uh, the more students are made aware of these options, the more they're going to they use them to assert power, albeit in this rather negative way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, Eric, come back, and then I, I want to write around me something. Then I'm going to bring Frank, then I'm out to the audience, yeah. OK, I could go in a bit more <laughs> on this detail about this, this idea that we do have to bear in mind that this victimhood ideology is an offshoot of a very long-standing tradition, which is this switch from a, a Marxist philosophy which focuses on workers and exploitation of the working class to identity-based exploitation. And actually that this new form of what I call left modernism is actually a fusion of two kinds of ideologies. One is the old Marxist left, but the, the other is this idea of modernism, which is anti-tradition. And these two things have kind of come together. And this is an extremely powerful force, and I think it's underestimated. The other thing I'd say is that when it comes to left-wing identity politics, what's interesting to me is it's not the same as right-wing identity politics. So on the right, you've got you know, Christian identity, you have white nationalism, you have the men's movement, you have all these things. There is no common currency or rule that would tell you who has to defer to who in that hierarchy. They come together maybe as a, a, an arrangement of convenience. Whereas on the left, there is a hierarchy where you have racial minorities, then you have, say, sexual minorities, then gender. So it's all about who's more privileged and who is more oppressed. And that's what I think makes the the left a little bit different from the right-wing identity politics. So I don't actually think on the left that the tribal identity politics is what's driving it. I think it's actually more this religion around victimhood oppression, which tells your group when you can be tribal and when you have to suppress your tribalism, which actually feminists will suppress their tribalism if it's about, say, not criticizing patriarchy amongst an ethnic minority group. Yeah, Remy, the last thing I wanted to ask you was, one of the things I find galling myself is that despite the fact that this is associated with kind of liberation, you know, it gives me as a woman a voice, it actually gives 
me as a woman the voice to say only one thing because mm -hmm. if you say if you as a woman go against what is the kind of orthodox view of women yeah. uh, as the, an identity group you get told that you're the wrong kind of woman or you get denounced and we've seen around the mayor of london campaign there's been some very unpleasant things said to a black candidate you know yeah. being called an uncle tom and a coconut and all of these things you can't believe that people are saying this and yeah. um, on the basis that he's He's not performing to what type? Kind of the tensions there in terms of like, even as you going mm -hmm. against identity politics are quite, there's quite a lot of pressure to conform in this, is there not? No, definitely. And also it's a psychological strategy by those who are, let's say, the most prominent voices within the black groups or so intellectuals and those driving um, identity politics to make sure people don't break ranks. So it's a, you know, psychological, emotional blackmail, which is um, uh, leverage against you that, you know, how can you, what, are you supporting those guys? Come on, you know, it's supposed to be us, yeah. We know what they've done to us in the past. And so we have to, you know, fight for our rights and we have to stick together. Only together can we achieve something. If we start breaking ranks, you know, that's what they want. They want to divide us. That's how they ruled us during colonialism. That's how they ruled us in the past. Okay, you can't allow that to happen. And I understand that psychological strategy. I mean, from their point of view, I'd also be saying the same thing. Okay, if I had their viewpoint. So I understand why they do it. And the only thing I mean people like myself can do is simply, you know, try and muster up the courage to speak your mind. And, you know, one person speaks, another person speaks, and it goes from there. You know, as long as, you know, obviously there's no violence or anything like that, I'm not going to start turning myself now into a victim and saying, oh my God, poor me, you know, black people are criticizing me, etc., etc." because some people also tend to do that on the right, also turn themselves into victims. So I'm not going to do that. You know, somebody calling you names on Twitter, you know, come on, that's nothing. You know, people have been killed in the past for stating their beliefs. If somebody's just going to, you know, call me names on Twitter, you know, <laughs> too bad. I can't live with that. Oh, we like that, the battle of ideas. All right, that's very good. Um, Frank, come back on anything. I suppose one, one of the questions that I've got is everybody's writing books on identity. I mean, it's like become... I'm, I'm not getting you, Eric. That's good. You, you, uh, Trenton, you're writing one as well. Of course. But no, but no, the, you know, it, we, we, there's been so many people cited Fukuyama's end of history at this festival that I feel like we're doing free PR for him. And he's now got a new book coming out on identity. And everyone's like... And that's kind of getting a lot of airplay. And it's like... One of the things is, are we, and there's the Mark Leela stuff and all the rest of it, blaming identity politics has also become very fashionable. Mm. Blaming identity politics for everything that's wrong with today's politics is something I notice all the time. And although I hate the phrase dog whistle, I'm going to use it. Uh, there is a, you know, there are some people who will say, you know, you kind of, kind of go, oh, identity politics as a sneer when you don't want to have to confront some difficult, awkward things that are happening in the real world in terms of maybe racial discrimination or whatever. So uh, it's kind of deployed by the alt-right with a great deal of glee. Oh, identity politics sneer. How do you kind of locate that sort of new blaming of identity politics? Is it any use at all to try and untangle it a bit more? I think what's most interesting about the alt-right is how they've work as a mirror image of their opponents mm. and the way they've adopted the identity of the people that they criticize. Unthinkingly, casually, they speak the same language of victimhood and they speak the same language of marginalization and they talk about their experiences in the same kind of a way. I think that uh, uh, unlike some of the comments people made, it's possible because we speak a different language or we have different understandings, I think that identity politics has got no redeeming features whatsoever. And I think uh, I would argue that most of the positive gains that were made by people of different oppressed minorities who've been exploited were made by movements that, were, that, that kind of preceded the identity moment in politics. The women's liberation movement was self-consciously not looking for difference. They were trying to be equal and same, similar to, to, to men. If you look at the gay liberation movement in its early moment before gay identity kicked in, it had def a, a much more liberal open-minded, tolerant kind of ethos. If you look at some of the civil rights movements in the United States, you know, before black identity kicks in, you'll find that it's, it's kind of language and it's narrative. And if you look at some of the great writings on the subject of, of black oppression by Dubois and all these other people, you know, that's a pre-identity moment when they're looking at much more of a, you know, a, a, a way you kind of transcend and, 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 and overcome what is, in fact, your, your segregated, isolated uh, kind of moment. So. I don't see any kind of um, redeeming elements. I also think that what people see as the extremes and the excessive identities uh, are not really 
uh, incidental. It's not an accident. I think uh, the embrace of victimization and victimhood didn't just arrive as a, on the margins of identity politics. It's totally integral to it. It's kind of deeply saturated in identity politics right from the very beginning. And there's a book that was published in America, which, which I kind of see as being like the first moment when identity politics kicks in. Uh, and, that, uh, and that particular book is called Don't Blame the Victim, which has this long, vic uh, long list of, of uh, identity groups, or not yet identity groups, but, but kind of will become. That's what they will become. And what you will find is that there is a kind of uh, 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 and a very important development. I think what's, what's important about identity politics that's often overlooked that distinguishes it from the desire to belong, which is totally normal, and uh, I agree with Eric, there's nothing wrong with pre-political affiliation, which is trying to belong to a group, with in enjoying belonging to a group. What is different between, between the at attempt to belong and the identity form is in the identity form, it's, it's very much linked with that kind of therapeutic imagination, the way that the psychological language becomes deeply uh, embedded in it. And if you look at the way that people talked about their group in the past, that therapeutic element wasn't really in there. And I think uh, it's interesting that uh, you mentioned about litigation culture. Uh, I think what, what that shows us is that identity politics actually depoliticizes public life. Because to, to, to make, victim, make victim culture work and litigation work, you need uh, uh, administrators, you need uh, various kind of consultants, Universities now have more administrators than rats. I mean, when you look at the, the, the way they're kind of growing <laughs> all, all over the place, you know, you have a, an entire, you know, all these institutions that are kind of balancing all the different identity groups. And that has a deadening effect on pu pu public debate and political life. And I think, the, to me, the, the, the major problem with, 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 with politics of identity is it, it actually reflects the death of politics because you can't argue against that and it's impossible. Yeah, I thought that was great what Remy, Remy said about lived experience. Funny, you haven't lived my experience. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> right, okay, I'm going to bring you lot in quite a few times, so kind of be prepared for that. This is for Frank. I write quite a lot about identity politics and how much I despise them and so on. But even so, I find there are definitional issues with it. And I even think in your you know, very interesting lecture, you didn't quite give us a very clear definition of what identity politics means as opposed to, for instance, you know, I was thinking, well, the suffrage movement, you know, in that your historicization is very 60s and onwards based. But I'm thinking, okay, the, 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 the battle for women's suffrage, the category of woman has had huge play in politics and domestic political, non-high party politics, and kind of campaigning for a long period of time. I'm thinking of a working class identity as a very strong identity before the liberatory campaigns of the 1960s and the you know, post-structural, post-modern turn. And I just want you, if you don't mind, to clarify why those, that category of woman as it was activated in suffrage campaigns and previously, and for example, working class as an identity, which definitely was pre-1960s, is not the same as identity politics. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Frank, I always agree with 90-odd percent of what you say, but unfortunately at events like this, I feel the need to ask you about the 10 percent I disagree with. The free country. Yeah, I know, and I, I say it's unfortunate because you always get the last word. Um, <clears throat> but I, I'm going to try again with a similar theme I've tried many times before. And, and my way into this is to say I don't think you've adequately explained what's wrong with identity politics. So you said it spoils the identities of others. It seems to me that's a practical problem, that's not a theoretical problem. And you've said that you can guarantee that more identities will come to the fore. That also is not an argument against identity politics. That's an argument for saying, well, look, we've had 10 already, let's have another 100. Why not? If you don't have a principled objection to identity politics, why not have more? And why not just manage them, which is what you seem to see as the, the practical problem. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that the reason why I think you're finding this issue difficult is that you do not want to embrace social conservatism by which I mean the idea that society needs collective norms. It needs men and women to play different roles. That, for example, is what transgenderism fundamentally challenges. It challenges the idea that men are men and women are women. And libertarians find that a very difficult argument to cope with. And people who believe in freedom, whether of the left or the right, also find it difficult to criticize. You can only criticize it if you embrace a form of social conservatism. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, 
I don't really know much about identity politics, really, until I came here. But one thing strikes me. It seems to be about powerlessness, in a sense, or victimhood. And uh, what's one thing that Claire said about a, a book, you know, you, you might say, oh, Shakespeare has universal appeal, and somebody with a particular identity and say, oh, yes, but that's just, you know, that, uh, that doesn't admit me or something like that. Is it, and it seems to me, is it just that people have, are not intelligent enough or educated enough and so feel that they have to reject that? And the other thing that struck me is the big figure now, hate figure, the big boogeyman that everybody nearly everybody loathes, is Donald Trump. Is that because he's white, rich, powerful? He's, he must be the big baddie of every single victim, and not just victims. And the whole thing seems to me about powerlessness and a way of becoming powerful by stressing your difference and making that almost like a cult. Okay, thank you. Where we think identity politics is going because when we look at kind of women's rights and suffrage uh, there was kind of an end goal a kind of victory condition for what you could achieve at the end of it whereas it feels to me that the difference between that and identity politics is this kind of preservation of everything as it is in this hierarchy of uh, kind of suffering when you look at people who kind of step out of the uh, uh, the reservation of, of what's acceptable within their identity look at kind of Majid Nawaz talking about Islamism or uh, even uh, uh, talking about kind of uh, gender pay gap statistics and how uh, that kind of uh, overshadows some of the kind of progress women have made in the workplace. It feels like there is a, a kind of fundamental anti-achievement, anti-progress mindset to this type of politics that is kind of fundamentally different to the uh, advancement, kind of achievement-driven stuff of um, uh, the movements in the past. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to ask, it's been touched on, but what do you think the overarching cause of this desire to be seen as a victim is? Because I don't think it is just as what Remy said, a, st a strategy for resources. I think there's something deeper going on. Okay, right. Um, I'm going to take this person, and then I'm going to come back to the panel. Pick up anything, right? And um, you want. I was really fascinated by uh, what you were saying about Ericsson. Uh, Frank, about uh, the, the early ev evolution of all of this and, and its roots, and your point that you made about this transition from childhood to adulthood, because it does seem to me that there really is the key to unlocking what's really going on, and I, I just wonder if you could explain that a bit more, just go into that a bit more, because it seems to me when, I, when you look at the world today, never mind the context within which identity politics takes place, is that we live in a society that no longer has an adult culture. You know, just look at the Kavanaugh thing. You know, it's like kids in the playground. I believe. I don't care what you say, I believe. And we're called upon to believe and to acknowledge and to recognize without criticism, without any responsibility for anything. And it just seems to me that what we've seen over the last 20 years, particularly with social media, where we're all looking for acknowledgement, we're on like children, trying to get affirmation continuously on, on social media, is now something that adults are doing. And so the ground within which identity politics is mired or can actually grow in, it has to be related to the fact that we are living in an infantilized culture. And it just seems to me that that's really where the problem lies and we really have to unpick that more to really get to grips with this. I'm taking the panel now and then I'll come back out. Just to say to you, the audience, I do not believe that everybody here thinks that identity politics is terrible and awful and destructive, right? It's not feasible. You know, there'll be lots of you thinking, well, you know, there's this and there's that, but what about this and what about that? So do feel free to speak, right? It's not, right, it's not compulsory that you agree with everything that you're hearing from the front. I actually don't think it's as new as people think. You can go back to the U.S. in 1916 to look at the origin of a culture that is kind of what, what would Daniel Bell, the sociologist, called the adversary culture. So in the 19, late 1910s and into the 1920s, you see the beginnings of a movement which is anti the dominant culture. So now it's true the dominant culture banned alcohol, which is not great, but uh, the, this idea that there was something sort of fundamentally sort of toxic about the dominant culture comes in already then, and in the 20s, you can see it in books by people like Sinclair Lewis uh, making fun of the kind of the mass of middle America. And so at the same time as you're getting this movement, they're also saying that we, we like the exoticism of black jazz, 
We like the exoticism of Greek immigrants, Italian immigrants. So there's this beginning of this kind of lauding of subaltern minorities and the denigrating of the majority, which I think is the origin long term of the kind of condition that we're in right now. And, and fundamentally, this is about, I think, a sort of religion, a leftist religion. And I actually don't think it's driven by tribe. I think that that leftist religion actually is the puppet master and the groups, whether racial, sexual, whatever, are actually the puppets. They're not what's driving this. So I think that's different, for, whereas on the right, it really is the tribes that are driving it. So that's a, a major distinction. Last point I'm gonna quickly make is that with economic equality and egalitarianism in the, say, 70s, where it was rising taxation, and, and I agree with a lot of what the left did economically, there, there came a point where this was then challenged by the right and you came to a, a median position. So there was a check on that. Whereas in the cultural sense, the cultural egalitarianism, we have not had a check on it. We haven't come to a moment where somebody's pushed back and said, actually, do we want to get rid of separate male and female washrooms like they've done here or male and female clothing sections? Or where is the actual limit to how far we want to take this cultural equality? Nobody has actually come up with something that can push back and say, okay, let's come to an accommodation. And that's one of the reasons why I think we're seeing this extremism in the culture. The gentleman over here talked about infantilization of society, but uh, what I actually was more interested in what he, he mentioned in passing was, was the, the social media element of this. And that's something I'd be interested in exploring more as a panel, because I, I think it's no coincidence that this particularly intense phase of identity politics has surged with the rise of the internet. So much of it is based on perceived acts of microaggression. Mm. And obviously, I think what's most significant is the fact that written exchanges can take place pretty much at the speed of live conversations. And this means that declarations that have only been half thought through can be examined for subtext in a way that they couldn't even 20 years ago. So I wouldn't say this is about infantilization, but there is an ability to obsess over casual exchanges and plug them for meanings and unintended insults in a way that there wasn't, say, kind of 20 years ago. And I think that's quite significant. Okay, thanks. Remy, I can okay. <coughs> yeah, I'll just get to the question regarding why identity politics um, is around. As I had mentioned um, earlier, it fulfills not just the interest-based function, but also a powerful emotional function. It gives people a sense of community. So for instance, we say, oh, we black people here in Britain, yeah? Now, that creates a sense of you know, community between a people who very often do feel they've had shared experiences, okay? We might really have actually gone through certain things which other groups might not have gone through, for instance, white people, yeah? That's a powerful thing. And don't get me wrong, I sit down in the room sometimes, you know, when it's only us black folk in the room with friends, and we talk about, oh, you know, Brits or might be like this or might be like that, or, you know, white people might be like this or white people might be like that. We share our experiences, laugh over it, you know, sometimes discuss it simply. So that, you know, if we call that identity politics, I don't know if it's politics, but it's definitely, you know, identity. It's strong, you know, group identity. So there's a powerful force there. Second, what it provides. If, you know, humans, as humans, we have the tendency to see the groups that have lost out, that have been on the losing side, essentially as victims. And we tend to see victims as essentially inherently noble, okay? So that provides the groups who are awarded victim status with a certain moral virtue, which is also a powerful thing to have, okay? We've been the oppressed ones. We've been the ones who've been robbed, killed, exploited, etc. Ergo, we are morally more virtuous than those who have oppressed, robbed, killed, etc. So that's also a powerful emotional function, a powerful emotional, I'd say, supply, which um, identity politics provides. Yeah, those Fine, are the two. That's, that's interesting. Thank you, Remy. Um, Frank? Yeah, some really fascinating questions. I, I'm really glad you asked that question about the women's suffragettes, because uh, one of the interesting things is that the, early, the first attempts to deal with oppression uh, is self-consciously anti-identity. So the first book written on the subject in relation to black politics is, is, on, is on Dubois' exploration of double consciousness, and Dubois wants to transcend uh, being black in the way that whites identify and, and being just simply black in the way that people are forced to be and to be something that is different to this kind of oppressed and, and kind of marginalized kind of group of individuals. So what he really is looking for is, is not to the maintenance or the celebration of an identity, but something that's very different. And the suffragists were doing the same thing. They didn't want to be women in the way that, there were a couple of individuals who 
who talked about women being nurturers and everything else, but the suffragettes wanted to be like men, or at, at the very least, they wanted the differences between men and women to be eroded. They wanted to be equal in all kinds of respects. And it's even more striking in the working class. There was no such thing as working class identity. I mean, Lenin put it most strongly when somebody said to Lenin, may the working class live forever. Lenin says, that's not true. The, Lenin, the faster we destroy the working class, and become somebody that is more universal, the better. So essentially, the idea was you transcend the position uh, that you're in. And that's, that was the common dominant narrative uh, at, at that particular time. And that changed. The first time we have a discussion of working class identity is when the left no longer exists. I mean, the, which when the left is destroyed, that all of a sudden you have all these nostalgic accounts about, about the beautiful mining villages and the special characteristics of working class people or, or the good salt of the earth like nobody else is. There are novels like The Ragged Trouser Philanthropist, but the main character in that novel is trying to read and educate themselves to not to be like you know, what they really are. So I, I think there is a kind of different approach altogether. And I think that you know, when somebody says, I haven't got a principled objection to identity politics, I do. And the principle is based upon the fact that if you celebrate you know, sort of uh, what you are rather than what you accomplish, then you, what you celebrate is human passivity. And it's when you celebrate human passivity where you basically you know, so haven't earned uh, respect, but you expect respect on the basis of who you are, then being a victim also becomes deeply entwined. Because victims, unlike people who are agents, you know, sort of demand these, you know, basically are expressing their pass passive relationship to the out outside and, and external world. And I think uh, that's the reason why we should really uh, sort of seriously object to that. I think there's a, a fundamental flaw in some of the comments being made. I don't see victim politics or identity politics as left-wing or inspired by left-wing. I think that these things were made possible by the complete political annihilation of any kind of leftist imagination. And I think the precondition for the flourishing of identity politics is always when the left becomes entirely marginalized from public life. And I think it's no coincidence that the day when identity politics kicks in, you have Althusser talking about the end of Marxism, you have Scholzenitz in denouncing the Soviet Union, you have all these left-wing tropes basically saying that we were wrong all along, and suddenly when you look at the campuses, identity politics flourishes, but there aren't very many left-wing people, and all the communist parties say goodbye to the world, and that's their end of history. Okay, thanks. Right, okay. A couple of points I wanted to make is that, first of all, there's a Buddhist idea that our attachment to our identity is the fundamental source of suffering. And if we can overcome that attachment and renounce our identity, not many, as someone said, I think, that it's very hard for most people to actually let go of one's identity because it's how we function and how we define ourselves in the world. And it's a thing that we can explore. The other thing that uh, picking up about Eric Erickson is these ideas are very Jungian. And it links back to the Pierre Eternus idea, this idea that there's a rite of passage between becoming a child and becoming an adult. Now, um, it strikes me that what should be an intrapersonal process has actually manifested itself in an interpersonal process, in an external conflict that we find ourselves in. And the final thing that I want to say, and strangely enough, this is the Academy, giving a plug for a Canadian website, which is strangely called the Academy of Ideas.com, which I'm sure you're aware of, <laughs> explains it really rather well in this set of short videos. So they go through all the ideas of Jung and, um, uh, uh, and the Pierre um, peer, um, uh, Eternus and that sort of thing very, very well. So hopefully that can contribute to some of the ideas that there are psychological, I believe there are psychological processes that are going on which manifest themselves in the outside world. I think that's very interesting. Thank you, sir. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, no, I really like the point that Eric made about this being more sort of like a grievance politics than something specifically just about identity. Um, and to Frank, I guess, the point I'd make is it's interesting to, to look at the sort of the history of the use of the term identity and the way it was used historically. Um, but it, I think it's hard to deny that there's been, identity has been fundamental to human sort of history throughout, well, the entirety of human history. Um, including people subsuming their individuality to a collective. I mean, including the ancient days of Greece, for example, Athenians versus Spartans, and you know, it was all about dying for the city-state. Mm. Later in history, uh, you had you know, Christendom versus the pagans versus Islam. Mm. 
Uh, you had later on in history the age of sort of nationalism with the states rising up and throwing off the imperial shackles that had sort of held them down. I don't think there's a point in human history where you cannot see a pattern of people subsuming their individual identities to a collective. And um, I don't know, do you think there is any sort of room for this? Is there, is there a sort of a healthy way in your mind of, of sort of expressing this kind of identity without everyone being at each other's throats all the time? Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid I missed the first half of Professor Faraday's opening address, so if you've touched on this already, my apologies. But I was interested in ascertaining what the views of members of the panel are on the relationship between the rise of modern identity politics and the decline of Christianity in the West. To me, this might be a massive oversimplification, but there seem to be a lot of similarities in the way that it works uh, when compared to the Roman Catholic Church, for example, the existence of, a, of an infallible caste of people which once upon a time would have been God and the priesthood is now taken up by the people who were emancipated, if you like, by the collapse of the Roman Catholic Church or the regression of the Roman Catholic Church, specifically, for example, women and homosexuals. But with that, with that liberation has come the absence of a morality that was once inherited by God. And therefore, it has been taken over, if you will, by the formerly oppressed. And these people have, as as it were, taken on the role of the martyrs of Jesus Christ himself, those who have suffered for your sins. Um, I was just curious if you think that there is any um, correlation with that, and also the idea of privilege as a concept being rather similar to the idea of original sin, with the difference being that salvation is possible with original sin, whereas with privilege it isn't. Okay, thank you. So just a quick question on the relationship between Tina, there is no alternative, and the rise of identity politics because it seems to me once you accept there is no alternative to the current way of organizing society that then identity identity politics and living with what exists already is what you then make a virtue of so I'd be interested in that link between Tina and when that whole idea emerges and the rise of identity politics. Okay, thank you. I'd just like to make a response to something Frank said. One of your rejections of identity politics was that it doesn't achieve anything. It's just an achievement of passivity. Uh, and I disagree with this. I think what makes identity politics so important is that it's an achievement of recognition because it's recognising uh, the importance of identity and what that means to individuals. And the reason, like, the best example for that, the best case study is amongst the trans community, and I don't know if anyone knows, but the, the suicide rate amongst the trans community is about 40%, which is ridiculously high. But if you break down that, those numbers, you see that if they come from a family that accepts them as trans, it reduces by up to 85%. Whereas if they come from a, a state like Utah, which is heavily anti-trans, then the suicide rate jumps up again. So I think the importance of identity politics is yes, it is recognizing something which you don't necessarily have to achieve. It is, it is passive, you are right there. But that doesn't mean you should